the titles for this bill, Mr. S Mr. Chairman. I call the Honourable Member Chris Hipkins. Yeah, so that's right. Thank you very much, <laughs> Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I'm uh, happy to take a, a brief call on the the title and commencement clause of the Crown Entities Reform Bill, and I'll begin with the title because that's what generally comes first. Uh, and actually, I think the the, the, uh, the name of the bill is misleading. Crown Entities Reform Bill, because it suggests a wider reform agenda for Crown Entities in total. Actually, a more accurate title would be Crown Entities Selected Entities Reform Bill, because it doesn't actually reform that many Crown Entities, and it's not actually that wider ranging reform agenda. Crown Entities, there's a huge number of Crown Entities, DHBs, NZQA, and if the government had some kind of coherent plan for what it wanted to do with the Crown Entities, uh, then this would be an, an adequate name for the bill, but it doesn't have an adequate plan. Uh, we've seen, for example, to the uh, just to give an example, this bill moves the Charities Commission into a government department, into the Department of Internal Affairs, uh, which is something that we have debated about quite a lot this evening. Uh, if that's going to be the government's overall agenda for Crown Entities, will we see NZQA merged into the Ministry of Education? Will we, see, will we see Trevor Mallard, the former minister, thinks it's a good idea? Uh, will we see the Tertiary Education Commission? I think that's a that's a, that's a big crown entity. Will we see that merged into the Ministry of Education? That's a very good idea. Will we see the DHBs merged into the Ministry of Health? Uh, these are questions that if, a, if, if this bill, that's not a good idea, if this bill genuinely was a crown entities reform bill, it would actually have a coherent... That's right, it's a Crown Entities minor tinkering bill, I think would be a more accurate description for this piece of legislation because it doesn't actually present a coherent plan for what the government are trying to do in state sector reform insofar as it relates to Crown Entities. Uh, this, and to move on to the commencement uh, of this particular piece of legislation, it comes into a force at the moment on all of this comes, uh, from what I understand, comes into force on the 1st of July 2012. So uh, can I congratulate the government at least on being clear about the date of the commencement for this piece of legislation? Uh, quite often legislation, uh, there's uncertainty uh, around when a bill comes into force because it says it's, uh, it comes into force on the day after which it receives the royal assent. Now, that couldn't, now there can be any number of variables that can impact on that. So there, quite often in legislation that we debate in the House, there's no certainty around that because, in fact, the day are, there, there, are, there are factors that can prevent a bill uh, receiving the royal assent. Uh, for example, there, there is a, technically a reserve power for the Governor-General to refuse to sign a piece of legislation. Uh, and so therefore, when, it, when a commencement clause says that it's the day after in which it receives the royal assent, that technically could be quite some time. And uh, in New Zealand, we're relatively fortunate. Uh, we, the the Governor-General will typically sign all legislation without too many issues. But if we take, for example, the Belgian Parliament, uh, where the King refused to sign a piece of legislation uh, because, he, because the, the King disagreed with it. Uh, and now, this is one of those bills that would come into force after, uh, the day after which it received the royal assent, but the King refused to sign it. So the, the, the uh, government in Belgium effectively removed the King from office for a day in order to enact the legislation and then restored it. It was, a, it, was a, it was a moral issue. It might have been a legalisation of prostitution or something like that. It was something that was a, was a, a conscience issue. And so the, the people of uh, the, the, the parliament in, in Belgium basically said, well, if the king won't sign it, we'll remove the king uh, for a period of time in order to, to give the prime minister the power to enact the legislation, because that's what happens in, in Belgium. Uh, and that's what they did. The bill then, therefore, uh, received the assent, uh, what would have been the royal assent, uh, but the king had refused to sign it, and therefore it became law. But well, because you know what we do in New Zealand in those cases? What's that? We, we send the, we send the gov offshore. So that's right. And, and get the chief justice to send the, uh, so, so in New Zealand, in New Zealand, as Trevor Mallard has just pointed out, were that situation uh, to occur and the governor general to be uncomfortable or, or refuse to sign something, the governor general could be sent out of the country and then the chief justice could sign the law. So that would be the New Zealand equivalent uh, of the bill receiving the, the, the royal assent uh, to what I was just talking about uh, with regard to what happened in, in Belgium. But in this, in this, in this bill, in this bill. Well, that's, that's, a, that's a very concerning thought. Uh, I, that's a very concerning thought. Um, so, but, the, but this bill, this bill, uh, there's, no, there's no ambiguity uh, at the moment as to the date on which this bill will come into a, a force uh, based on the current wording of it as the 1st of July 2012. However, the supplementary order paper put forward by my colleague Trevor Mallard would change that 
uh, and it would say at part three, instead of part three coming into effect, Mr Chair, Mr Chair. I call the Honourable Member Chris Hipkins. Thank you, Mr Chair. So instead of the bill coming into effect in its totality on the 1st of July 2012, part three would come into force uh, uh, on, uh, on the day three years after the date in which this Act receives the Royal Assent. So actually, I, I think Trevor Mallard made a mistake. Yep. I actually think he should have been specific in the date that he wanted it to come into force, rather than uh, this, uh, this whole concept of three years after the date on which it re uh, receives the Royal Assent. Because, as I uh, have just outlined, that can be very uncertain, and there can be some, uh, there can be confusion, there can be complication. Uh, whereas, if, you, if a, a specific date is specified, there's a lot more certainty. So, I actually think Trevor Mallard probably should have said the 1st of July 2015. Uh, that would have uh, that would have uh, avoided any amb why did, ambiguity. Why did you say so? Well, that's right. I, I clearly, I, I'm, I'm normally hanging off every word that Trevor Mallard says at caucus, but in this particular instance, I have to, I have to confess, I have to confess that it slipped past my usually uh, very accurate radar. Um, now, Trevor Mallard has suggested that this should come into force. The part three should come into force three years after the rest of the act. Um, well. With, uh, with all of the, uh, the things that I've just said about how it might not be exactly three years, but more or less three years after the rest of the bill uh, comes into force. And that is because we in the Labour Party believe that the Charities Commission, which is a relatively new entity, hasn't been in existence for particularly long, uh, shouldn't be disestablished until a proper process has been gone through with the charitable sector who have bought into having the Charities Commission through a, a pretty collaborative and consultative process. This government are simply doing away with it because National knows best, or National thinks it knows best. Actually, uh, in the charitable sector, I think it's important that the, the sector are involved, that they get a chance to have their say, and they get a chance to feel some ownership of whatever decision is, uh, is taking place or is finally made. And I think delaying this part three of the bill by three years in order to allow the charitable sector to get involved in that, to have a proper review, to allow the Charities Commission to actually prove what it's capable of doing, to preserve that independence of the Charities Commission in the meantime, I think those things are really quite important. Uh, and that's why a delay of three years seems eminently sensible. It would allow a proper review process to take place. It would allow the government to finally work out what its agenda for Crown Entities is, come up with a slightly more coherent plan for state sector reform around what it's trying to do with Crown Entities, resolve the issues of whether all of the Crown Entities now are going to be put up for review uh, and, and treated in the same way of the Charities Commission, merged into government departments where ministers can fiddle around and play with them. And we know that some of the ministers fiddle around and play with things even more. Can, can we imagine, for example, if Murray McCulley was made the Minister for Internal Affairs? Murray McCulley would be in there, boots and all, telling the Charities Commission part of Internal Affairs exactly what they should be doing. The independence would be uh, totally compromised, uh, and therefore the buy-in and the support from the sector, from the public, could be uh, quite badly compromised. So I think uh, preserving the independence of the Charities Commission is quite an important thing. It's something we in the Labour Party are strongly in favour of. I doubt the ability of, uh, I, I doubt um, that Internal Affairs will be able to manage this as well as the Charities Commission can manage it at the moment. So time to take a breath, time to actually go back, have a proper review, rather than just the national knows best, we're going to do whatever we like. Review it properly, have a collaborative uh, process with the sector where the sector all get to have their say, and then once that is, uh, is done, I imagine that we'll be getting up towards the three-year time frame uh, that M uh, Mr Mallard has specified in his SOP, and that would be a good time uh, for which for Parliament to revisit the issue. Thank you. I call the Honourable Member Denise Roach. Tēnā koe. Tēnā koe, Mr Chair.